Because you started the webinar, I have begun recording. Hello. So any joining, if you want a message and have like a chat where you guys can all see each other's comments, whenever you type a message, uh, change the setting from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. Justin, is your mic hooked up? about now now you're back cool weird okay I'll get rid of the lapel mic well hi everybody <laughs> excuse me I wonder have you been talking for a while because I genuinely just thought you were being quiet no no I've been talking for a while saying hi to folks Oops. Uh, familiar uh, <laughs> names among the attendees that I'm missing from uh, uh, actual artist expos in the past here. 
but we'll have future years for that. So it's great that everybody can get together virtually today and hang out and do some weathering and have some fun here with some plastic dolls. Let's play with dollies. So hey folks, um, I am uh, Justin McCoy, uh, Mr. Justin with Secret Weapon Miniatures, uh, here today to do some uh, weathering for you guys. In this particular class, I'm going to walk through as many of the um, weathering techniques as I can um, over the course of about an hour and a half so that we have 30 minutes at the end here for Q&A. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, several different ways to get uh, chipping done, one of which I actually need to run to my uh, kitchen for because I forgot to bring salt with me, little things, you know. So I've got to go to the kitchen for some uh, salt real quick, but that won't take long. Um, but I'll show you how to do chipping with uh, brushes, with sponges, with hairspray, with salt. Uh, we're going to look at some oil paints. Uh, we're going to look at uh, how to use uh, washes uh, to achieve um, uh, the same effect uh, in many ways as the oil. Um, talk about the benefits of oil and enamel, um, the pros and cons. Um, yeah, and do everything I can in the time that we have to, to show you all of that stuff. So give me one second to go grab that salt. All right, see, it's the little things. I'm not even kidding. We've got to have the salt here, right? <laughs> All right, so let me get started. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, put down a base coat, um, just with some rust color on here because uh, I kind of enjoy painting rust. Anyone that's taken classes with me before, I'm sure you're shocked. Shocked, also, shocked, shocked, I say. I'm really trying not to interrupt this one more time, but uh, there was a question earlier on that mm -hmm. you might have answered, but because we know I couldn't hear you, I had no idea if you had answered. It's for Matthew Ruley. Okay. Uh, did you need to glue the top of the dumpster down beforehand? Um, well, I don't have the dumpsters here. I'm just using uh, the um, uh, cargo containers from Reaper. Um, if you've got one that you're going to be working along with me, cool. Uh, if you've got something glued, uh, go for it. I'm just using these as test pieces. I actually have some spare Lehman Rust bits sitting around too. Um, but if anything else, I mean, if you're going to uh, follow along with me here at home, um, you can even take a piece of uh, plastic card, uh, whatever you've got lying around. Um, I paint my rulers on a regular basis. So here's me testing some heat effects on a ruler. Once upon a time. All right, let's see, which piece am I going to use first? I'll use this one. So I'm literally just slapping color down on this first. Remember folks, as with all the dropper bottles, don't just keep squeezing. <laughs> that way it's made of regret. Paint towel. And brush, some water. Someone out there is crying. Do, 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 do. Hey, look, an uneven brown. Do, 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 do. Just gonna get a few more colors in here just to make it a little bit more interesting. I'm going to do that <clears throat> using one of the techniques that we can actually uh, uh, use to create our chipping, which is a bit of foam here. Uh, and I'm going to go kind of extremes. I'm going to make a few spots. We're going to call this the bottom instead of the top for a change. Pick up two. It's almost like I haven't had a lot of time to paint recently. So how many classes have uh, folks been taking so far? And do you have a favorite?
fourth of the day. Wow. Uh, is that a towel sewn to be like a sleeve? No, this is a sock uh, with the toe cut off. <laughs> uh, I have uh, piles and piles of old socks that are now paint towels. So yeah, old sock. <laughs> they make great paint towels. Um, there are uh, professional quality paint towels that actually like uh, button and sometimes have little pockets and other little neat features. Uh, I've just, I've used a sock for years. Um, Jim Wapple is famous for this. Uh, he's always wearing a sock on his wrist when he paints. All right, let me get a little orange in here. Oh, I'm going to shake my paint. Let me get rid of that. And again, this is just going to be the base color for what we do later. For our hairspray. All right, quick and easy rust. Everybody's favorite part. We get to blow dry. It's a really bad idea to blow dry your acrylics, so don't do it. <laughs> but for the sake of uh, expediency. All right, so there's a basic rust for me. And now I'll show you how to take that same technique I was just using to make blotches and turn them into chips, particularly works on an edge. You just take your uh, sponge, get some paint from table, palette, wherever you need to. You want to get a lot of it off, so I tend to give it little dabs on my fingernail, see how it's going to look. And I can just come right in and get nice random chips that way. Do it in a couple of colors, you'll get some depth. But it's really that easy. Oh, Greg's weathering class, awesome. That is awesome. All right, let's take, have a sip of water here. Mm -mm. Okay, so this is the fun one. Uh, we're gonna talk about salt and we're gonna talk about hairspray. I am going to do uh, salt first, and let me. Oh, I did have salt in here. I forgot. I cleaned it up. I moved it off of my desk. No wonder I couldn't find it. It's where it belongs. I'm going to tape off half of this and say, no paint, no paint for you. None. You get zero paint. All right. So the two. Uh, yeah, I can tell you what colors I'm using. Sorry about that. For the rust, um, I'm using the uh, Secret Weapon Rust set, um, which runs uh, Rust Shadow, Old Rust, uh, Brown Rust, Red Rust, Orange Rust, and Yellow Rust. It's the only one of those that is a sextet instead of a, a trio. Um, the other one I'll be using uh, shortly um, is actually a Dollar Rowney ink, uh, and I will be using their Cool Gray uh, to give us the best contrast here to really show it off. All right. So the two techniques I'm going to do now are hairspray and salt, and I'm going to do them separately, and I want to make it clear that you can do them separately. Um, I see on the internet a lot of times uh, people saying it's salt and hairspray, that they have to be done together, that if you're trying to get uh, salt to adhere to a model, the only way you're going to do that is with hairspray, and that's just not true. Uh, you can use water. That's right, water. That's not my water bottle, though. Both of those are isopropyl. And I don't want to go spraying isopropyl on everything. So what I'm doing is I'm loading my airbrush with water. I'm going to get my surface wet. Literally going to sprinkle salt. It's my little airbrush clean out basin. That way I don't have salt all over my desk all the time. And I'm going to hit this corner nice and heavy. Just give it a little gentle sprinkle here and there. 
really want a nice heavy spot down there where you can really see that. And then from a reasonable distance, I'm going to spray more water over the top of that salt. Just a little bit. I don't want to dissolve it, but I do want it to stay in place when I airbrush over it. I'm going to give that a very gentle blow dry. Again, I'm at a distance of at least a foot away from it at this point. I don't want to blow the salt around. Uh, your best option is actually just to leave it to dry on its own, to evaporate on its own. Uh, but again, in the effort to uh, an interest of expediency for a class. Uh, for this particular technique, uh, these next two are specifically airbrush uh, techniques, but um, with a heavy enough salt, for instance, if you're using the big uh, kosher salt, um, I have actually had some mixed success um, applying that uh, with rattle cans. So I can, you know, put my base coat down on the model, uh, put my salt on it, uh, hit it with a rattle can, and generally have good luck. Generally, <laughs> not always. But most of these, no airbrush required. Okay. I'm going to hit this with gray. Let's give it a little bit of highlight because we can. I'm just going to take some white if I can find it. Yeah. A couple drops in there. Just going to give us a little highlights. Coming from the top. Let it just hit the top of those salt crystals. And I'm sure you're shocked. I'm going to hit with the blow dryer yet again. Oh, I'm glad the screen is back. All right, now hopefully that's dry because if it's not, this makes a bit of a mess. Uh, yeah, there we go. Dry enough anyway. So I am brushing off the salt, which acts as a positive mask. Oh, that brush is wet. I do not want to use a wet brush. I want to use a dry brush. Just a nice, soft, dry brush. Because so my goal here is just to take the salt off. Ooh, let's come back so you guys can see it a little easier. Come in with a bit of water now, just to clean it up a bit, but not with this brush. <laughs> You're too soft. Yep, because that gray was still a little damp, so you can see I'm actually just mixing in some of that color now. I want to get that out there, so you guys can still see your corner from where it was actually the salt. But now the nice thing about this is you get all of those little chippity chippities without having to spend hours and hours and hours pecking at it with a brush, painting each one, getting there and stippling um, with a sponge even. Um, it's a nice way to do a heavy, uh, very random rust. Um, it's always uh, it's always going to be semi-random, no matter how careful you're being. Like in this case, I was really applying it heavily down here. Uh, but because it's salt, it's still going to get away from you. Cool gray paint over the cool gray ink. Uh, that was uh, white over uh, cool gray. And both of these are inks. They're the Dollar Rowney inks. Yeah, Reaper, Secret Weapon, and Dollar Rowney are the brands that I do my painting with every day. All right, well, let's 
suppose I should have opened that first, whatever. I am now going to cover off the other end and show you the hairspray side of this. And it is exactly what it sounds like. I have a can of Aquanet. It's my hairspray. Uh, this is actually a shiny new one. I need to find my, my old bottles floating around here somewhere. I've got uh, one I've been using for years. Um, yeah, when you're looking for um, a hairspray product, uh, look for something that's maximum hold, that has no scents or oils in it. Uh, that way you're not getting any weird reactions to it. Um, there are commercial chipping products available. Uh, by and large, I haven't been uh, terribly impressed with them. Certainly not uh, when hairspray works, you know, almost always. Even those products are almost always. All right. So I am going to, let me get another paper towel so I don't get this all over my table today. Going to put a thin coat of hairspray. That's it. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a nice day. All right. And I'm going to dry that. I'm sure you're shocked. Put on a dry hair thing. Gonna make me late for my big date. All right, I'm gonna dab up some of this excess that isn't drying, just because you don't need to wait that long. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, the hairspray, what this is gonna do for us is actually create a water soluble mask between what we have down now and what I'm going to put on over it. Doop, 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 doop. Which, not surprisingly, the paint I happen to have already on hand. Use up the last of that white. Rinse my airbrush. As I say, I've been using my airbrush rinse cup all morning, and now you can't find it. We are rinsed. And to no great surprise, So as with the other side, when we did the salt, we want this to be as dry as possible. Uh, that way we're not just pushing color around. Now, I'm going to leave this probably still a little bit wet just because that's kind of our timing at the moment. I just need to show you all we can, right? All right, I've got some brushes. I'm gonna get a little bit more sponge. Oh, what am I gonna do? Mm, it's time to take out the toothbrush, I guess. Mm, what else? What else can we have some fun with? Ooh, where's my uh, where's my uh, box of toothpicks? My box of toothpicks is missing. Why is my box of toothpicks missing? Who has taken the box of toothpicks? Checks my son's desk. <laughs> huh, not this time. All right. All right. No toothpick. Oh, I've got a. I've got a. Ah, the air, old airbrush needle I use for poking around with. We're gonna use all of that to mess around with this side. So this is the hairspray side. And like I said, it, uh, the hairspray creates a water soluble layer um, between that rust and our new white coat. Now, the nice thing about our acrylic is it's porous. So let's start right here. I'm just gently stippling. You'll notice too, excuse me, that I'm wiping away my edge or wiping off my brush because I am pulling up that paint. That white is coming off. 
little bit more water. I can also use the edge of my brush to get those edges. But now let's have some fun with getting some texture in here too. So this time I'm gonna get, uh, let's get this section damp. Put some paint in there or water on there. And with this nice rough brush head, stipple, 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 stipple. And what I'm doing is pulling away that paint. gap over there like it probably bouncing you there. And of course, I can still take the edge of a brush like this, get it damp. and just hit those highlighted sections of the container. Oh. Still a little damp, but I'm not gonna make you guys listen to me uh, <laughs> hit it with the hair dryer again. All right, let's take a look at something uh, different. We are going to take this piece, and mm, it's going to be tricky because I brought a textured piece. Let's uh, let's use our old buddy the Lehman Russ here, and we are going to make some uh, quick and easy chips. Uh, but, 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 but before I do that, yeah, I get to get another thing. It's great having to do all of this from home because I know where all of my missing studio stuff is, except for my toothpicks. Looks like this time I can chalk a missing thing up to my kid. He's taken off with my colored pencils again. That's a bummer. All right, we will come back to that. That's fine. There are lots of other chipping techniques to do. So we talked about it earlier, but I actually want to show this one off. I'm going to take some red rust, just because I happen to be where I grab. Make a little boop, boop, boop. It's a professional term for that. It's a boop, boop, boop. Load up that brush, my little foamy bit here. This is just pluck foam from extra bag. And you can see I'm taking most of that paint off. Check it on my nail. And now, very gently, let's do it on the edge here. It's a little more visible. Turn that off. Okay, airbrush, we'll play more later. Paint it off. And this is the one when I'm asked, uh, particularly on things like uh, Space Marines, um, if people are trying to do uh, chipping on Marines. Um, I don't recommend something like the hairspray or the salt method uh, at that size. It's very easy for those to get. Um, 
just get away from you. Uh, so what I'll actually do is load up a teeny tiny bit of brush or a foam rather. And I can generally pinch that tight enough that it's not going to get loose for me. Give it a shot. There we go. Poke, poke, poke. Poke, poke. And then I can get into little spaces with it. And that way you can get something like this onto space marine legs and boots and pauldrons and whatnot a lot more easily than you can get, you know, generally speaking, a big chunk of this or trying to get uh, a salt and hairspray out of, you know, tight little nooks like that. All right. So next, that's one way to do chips. Do, 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 do. We're going to do another way. I told you there'd be so many. Come on, tape. Both sides, and nah, now why would I do that? All right, I am going to take this piece of tape and I'm going to make us a nice big scratch right across there. Boom. It's going to be super scratchy. And I am going to take, oh, do, 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 do. I don't have a black or a white with me, do I? I do have my neo white. I don't have a black, so let me go with my dark iron. Actually, I'll just use the uh, black ink. I have some black ink. Sure, I have that. Not, I'm absolutely positive I have Payne's Gray because there will be at least five bottles of Payne's Gray in here. Like this one. That'll do. <laughs> All right, well, it's also not going to work if I'm putting white on white. Justin, don't be silly. So we're going to do this a little more exotic today. Um, we are going to highlight in... Let's do it in yellow. Gonna have some yellow chips here because why not and this is rebel yellow um you can do mud in a similar fashion i would recommend uh building it up in layers um, but i'll also show you how to create some really awesome mud using uh the dry pigment sets and maybe some sand but mostly dry pigment we'll get to that in just a few minutes all right, so I'm going to start by getting a brush wet and loading up some Rebel Yellow. And I'm going to immediately regret choosing such a light color. All right. I'm going to choose, uh, this would be the Verdigris Pale Green. And start again with a color we can actually see. Do, 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 do. And I am stippling right over the edge of my piece of tape. What that's going to do for me is keep it even on one end. Well, I sort of am. <laughs> uh, we uh, we produce this line in cooperation with Reaper, actually. So if you're ever visiting the factory in the future, there's a chance you'll see our paints uh, in production there. But uh, any of these colors can be replicated. Uh, goodness knows any of Anne's colors. Um, she's got anything you're going to need. Some of these have, um, are especially formulated for effects. Uh, for instance, the yellow rust is a translucent. Um, Engine rust is like one of Anne's liners. Um, yeah, the heat series is translucent as well, uh, but not a wash. It's actually just a translucent paint. All right, so now I'm taking black and I'm going right over my green, but not everywhere. I'm trying to get little spots. take off my tape. Let me get a better zoom for you guys or a better focus. I can do that manually or I should still. All right, 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 right. You're going to let me do it. Bring
looking at my camera properties. Video settings. Well, that was weird. That did not work. Well, this one doesn't want to let me zoom. So I will, or I mean, manually focus. But hopefully that shows up there for you. Be able to see it's a nice straight line. We've got our highlight and our shadow built into it. Bring chat and Q&A back up here, which got closed on me for some reason. Sorry about that little hiccup there, folks. But yeah, Reaver absolutely has the colors to match. Um, at least the color, if not always the effect of these. And in the case of what we're doing right now with the rust, um, that's not one we need to worry about. So let me put my rust colors back for now. Uh, any questions at this point about the chipping methods that we've done? Because that is going to be the end for uh, paint chipping. All right, so um, another big one uh, is oil and enamel paints. <clears throat> I have both handy, but I'm going to be demonstrating uh, the oils today. They are very similar in their properties and how we uh, work with them. Uh, which method is my go-to? Which method of, oh, um, of weathering this way? Oh, well, that's, uh, that's a trick question, to be honest. Um, each of them has its place for me. Um, you know what, actually, I'll, I'll show you my favorite, uh, my favorite trick is actually layering all of these. Uh, we don't have to do this just once, and we don't have to take off the layers in between. Um, yeah, and I don't ever show that off. So give me a minute to show that off. I think you guys will dig this. Now, these two are still coming back to airbrush techniques, but for these really cool, heavy, random, rusty bits. So I'm getting this wet again, salting it up again. I am going to blow it right again. So one of the things I really like about these two techniques in particular is that they're actually subtractive. I am subtracting uh, a top layer of paint to get to something underneath it. Uh, so I don't have to worry about selling a 3D uh, effect. I don't have to trick the eye, um, which with a lot of these other techniques, uh, particularly if we're doing you know, additive techniques like this, where we're building up, um, I find it a lot harder to trick the eye, uh, particularly if you get into heavy weathering. All right, but let's see, I've got another layer of spray paint there. I'm just going to start grabbing some random opaque colors. Translucent, you should do with my opaques. Opaque, and I'm just doing these totally random colors. This is Dollar Rownie's uh, light green uh, because we're gonna do this in a few layers and I want you to be able to see how that works out. to do no surprise everybody's favorite part Here we go. All right. 
Another layer of water. Nice and light. All right, and uh, what else have I got here? What else have I got here? Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. It's a nice opaque colors. What's like opaque? Translucent. Why are you translucent? Indian yellow. You should be Indian yellow, right? No, you're antelope brown. Look like Indian yellow. Yes. Ultra. Well, first, here we go. And right over that green. Oh, I got it wet, didn't I? But I didn't. Saltus. And if I did, yeah, let's get some more and not worry about it. This will just be extra, extra weather. And that's kind of what I'm going for. So. And because I tend to do large pieces, um, I use the salt and the hairspray methods more often. All right, that's good to go. Let me get my yellow over the top of that. Yep, that is a triple salt treatment. And we can do the exact same thing with the hairspray. Build it up in layers. Is this out? And last time. That should be nice and dry. I'm going to get a bit of sponge here and down through our green layer, down to our brown layer. Because this is still wet, we're getting some bleed. You can see how much paint's coming off because I don't have time to let it dry completely. But I can clean this up real quick for the sake of class. Just if I run the brush on it a bit, just to clean up it, make it a little less dirty. And this is one I do a lot because I get that nice multi level. Oh, it's shiny. Let's hit it one more time for you so you don't have to get the shine. There you are. <laughs> and I will use that. I should have a decent example handy. So this is uh, an example of it with the hairspray technique as well. Um, so I've used that through here um, to make the paint look like it's peeling. Um, it's awfully dusty right now. Let me uh, clean that off. Time to put this old boy under the tap again. Oh my goodness. There's actual dust on my windshields now. Uh, but that rust there on the roof uh, was done with the uh, layers of the salt technique. 
um, to make it really heavy, to make it very random for me. Another one. This one's a little worse for wear at the moment. The sign broke on me. Uh, but all of this on the roof um, was also done with the hairspray technique. And I'll show you a couple of things we can do to be very gentle with our hairspray. So in this case, I used um, the edge uh, of one of these to create the streaks that you'd find uh, in a roof like that. Uh, but the scale of these pieces, again, is why I tend to use salt and hairspray more than anything else. And in that vein, let me uh, get a table. So I'll just start tracking that everywhere. All right. I can take a nice fine tip brush onto my hairspray side and very carefully uh, drag sections away. I don't have to use a heavy brush. That's right, I didn't even get the head toothbrush in here for you. I've got to show you guys the toothbrush. <laughs> but I can get in here with a nice, fine, soft brush. Drag, 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 drag. Stipple, stipple, stipple. Stipple, 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 stipple. I can also get a section wet. Not too much. Fine, no, no harm. Uh, and I can take that airbrush needle I mentioned earlier. And I can come in and create itty bitty specific scratches. I've even done it to carve initials uh, into the sides of uh, garbage cans and things like that. Ah, great question about um, uh, how to seal it uh, in order to prevent the hairspray from uh, still being active. Um, and that's, yeah, as simple as your mat sealer. No problem. But otherwise, yeah, you'll be able to work with this uh, for many, many days. In fact, I happen to have a project, a work in progress, uh, right here <laughs> uh, that I'm actually using this technique on. Um, this is covered in hairspray. Uh, you wouldn't know it, <laughs> uh, and that's kind of the idea. Um, let me get this out of here so I don't work it. The other thing I do is add all the little details. So Forge World's cockpit is completely dull and empty, and we couldn't have that. So. Um, but in this case, uh, the whole model is actually coated um, uh, in a chrome paint uh, because I wanted to capture the look of pilots getting in and out that worn edge and I can do that right here so you guys will get to watch this happen for in real time now I can be done with that again activating it all on this panel. Give it a few seconds to soak through and I can I'm being very gentle. Maybe too gentle. Yeah. 
Let's try the toothbrush. We'll get them in the other piece too. The nice thing about the toothbrush is it has nice stiff bristles, fine points, and it can really get in there randomly for you. I'm still being fairly gentle because I'm trying to create the impression that it's entrance and egress, but not get carried away. Take my paper towel, I'm gonna dry that section off now, and right like that, right before your eyes, it's alive. I get that nice chipping right there on the engine now. And I will add some of that coming forward on this wing. In this area here. Maybe a little bit on the other side, but I'll probably just leave the one side and get it up here and we're be climbing in and out. But again, that's my go-to because it's uh, it's big. <laughs> All right. Um, and I did promise you uh, one other cool trick with the... Uh, so I get for getting salt everywhere with the hairspray side. And that is our little buddy, the toothbrush. I am going to get the whole model wet. And there we go. I'm going to take my toothbrush by the little end of it. And I shall punish this model. Show it who's boss. Rawr. And some really random, really heavy chipping. Uh, can you, in theory, do it without do the uh, hairspray method without an airbrush? Um, you can give it a shot. Um, I've never seen it work, uh, only because when you're applying that layer, you need to make sure that the hairspray stays dry and you don't want to be moving it around. Your paint is going to be very wet. Um, so as soon as you start applying a brush, it's going to pick up that hairspray and just carry it away with it. And these two for the big models like that um, really are airbrush techniques. But we have our sponge method. We have the um, tape and brush method. Uh, plenty of ways for us to do fun little chipping without having to worry about the airbrush. Uh, so now, though, I want to talk about some oils and some enamels. Let me. Well, before I do that, does anybody have a question for me uh, about these methods as we came back to it again? Covered a little new ground. I get back in the habit here. I haven't had a chance to teach this class in, well, it's been about a year. Crazy. All right. Let's play with some oil paints. The benefits to oil and enamel um, are simply uh, long working times. You can very easily create translucency uh, because you have time to thin it and thin it and thin it and thin it and thin it. Uh, whereas acrylic paint, of course, is designed to dry uh, very quickly and we tend to be applying it in very thin layers. I'm using the Gamblin uh, oils today. And I'm going to get uh, two brushes here. Uh, I'm just going to get a liner and a little detail. Um, and I'm going to start by picking up some of my raw sienna. And I am going to just slather it all over this piece. Blah, make it look like crap. Blah. There, big old messy, 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 messy mess. Doesn't matter. It's perfect. I'm using Mona Lisa, odorless, terpenoids. Odorless uh, does not mean uh, non-harmful. <laughs> uh, 
if you find yourself um, locked in your room in your studio all day doing a lot of weathering, uh, make sure you have good ventilation. So you can see I'm coming right over the top of this with my Mona Lisa now. And I'm going to start pulling it down, creating my little runnels, staining the area. If I decide that it's too much, it's too heavy, again, one of the benefits here is that I can, I have a lot of working time. And by a lot, I mean days. Uh, with oil paint, uh, less so with washes when you make it this thin, but if you're applying it a little heavier, like for some mud and whatnot, uh, you'll have days to work. And even with nice little thin sections like this, uh, you can generally come back the next day and really keep thinning it out, removing it. I decide that I want some additional uh, heavy streaking, no problem. Come down here, I'm gonna pick up that little point right there. This time I'm gonna be gentle. But you see, I've just made a nice heavy line. Nothing pretty about it. But now, now it's wet, so it's hard to see. There you go. I get my nice little spots. Another nice thing about the oils and the enamels is your ability to blend them. So if I wanted to bring in my additional rust colors, um, again, that working time, just like when I'm working traditionally with oils, um, having that time is just nice. It's a real benefit. All right, let me clean off this brush. And let's talk about doing that with acrylic though, because not everybody wants to go out and get some oil paints, some enamel paints, um, particularly, I mean, <laughs> This is more oil than uh, most hobbyists uh, doing this for figures and models um, is ever gonna use. So we're working on getting some 20 mil tubes out here soon. About, about as much as any artist in our hobby is ever gonna need. Um, but let's talk about a couple of ways to do um, rust with acrylic. We've got a couple of our fun little things and you can do this by making a wash. So I'm gonna do one wash and two specialty products. Um, this is the yellow rust. Well, that's not fair. That's translucent to begin with. Let's take orange rust for you. Also known as Rossian. <laughs> All right, so I am going to make really thin wash out of this. All right, I'm going to wick some of it off on my towel. You can use your paper towel, whatever you happen to be using. And same idea, except this time I need to be more gentle because I don't have as much uh, to work with. I don't have as much time. But I'm just gonna do this in layers. And what I'm gonna do is pull up to where I want the heaviest concentration. still stipple like I did on the other side and we can get a very very close approximation to what we can do with the oils and this will work with any color that you want to streak with if you decide you've got um, green gooey stuff streaking down the side great uh, any of the colors is gonna work this is our, our fantasy world we can do as we please uh, this one is engine rust like I said this performs a lot like one of the Reaper liners. And it's actually meant to do that heat oxidization color for, uh, well, that you get on exhausts. But I can do the same idea. Let's get it over here. Gonna get the area right around it. And pull up. Oh, 
didn't shake it enough, so it's a little thick. Yep, and you can already see that because it was thick, I've already lost my ability to work with it. So that is the trick of trying to go acrylics when we're going heavy. A nice thin wash, build it up in small layers. You can get very close to your effects of oil and enamel. The trick still being that even right now, after all of this time that I've sat here ignoring that side, I can come in and pretty much erase it. It doesn't have to exist. It could go. All right. So let's see, we have uh, oils and enamels, at least in theory. Uh, we've talked about lots of ways to do chipping. We've talked about the hairspray method. We've talked about uh, the salt method. We've talked about using um, sponges to create chipping um, and texture. Doop, 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 doop. Oh, my goodness. We've talked about all the things. This is crazy because I realize now that a big chunk of this class when I'm doing it live is all of the questions and banter and all of the goofy stuff that we're doing <laughs> when we uh, should otherwise be doing the class. Um, the benefit to this is that it means that we have a lot of time here for the Q&A uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be specific to um, uh, weathering. If it's a technique that I can show you guys, if it's something I can demonstrate for you, I'm happy to do it. Uh, this is your time, so I'm happy to use it however you like. Clear this out of here. Um, oh, thank you. Oh my goodness. I'm glad one of us knows what I'm doing. Of course I can demonstrate pigments. Oh my goodness, nobody leave. <laughs> wow, how could I forget the pigments? They're right here in front of me. All right, let's play with some dry pigment. That's where the other part goes. Like I said, it's been a weird year. Not a lot of teaching going on. Let's get some rusty pigment. Let's get some yellowy pigment. Oh, uh, uh, let's get some green. Let's get my personal favorite. Oh, it's missing. Why is it missing? Ow. Somebody put a lamp there. Oh, on top. All right. Eight gray. Heavy smog. All right, let's play. So these are the dry pigments. Um, obviously, I'm using the Secret Weapon brands today. Uh, I have had a uh, good experience uh, in the past. Um, well, I should say a mixed experience with most brands out there. Um, the trick to look for when you're working with pigments like this or looking to shop for pigments like this um, is to make sure that they are pure and unadulterated artist grade pigments. Uh, some companies make a big deal about the size of their pigment. They'll say, oh, it's 50 microns or less. Um, all artist pigments are, it doesn't matter. Um, and at our scale, even if you're above 50 microns for a pigment size, it's still not gonna matter. Um, but there are like in the micro, I forget, one of the miniature company, micro art, and then there's micro mark, the tool company, the tiny tool people. Um, Micromark is big on selling um, like structured and bonded, uh, no adhesive required pigments. And those are garbage. They include um, dried glue in them and they're meant to be brushed on. Uh, the other thing you want to avoid are uh, inexpensive pastels, um, particularly inexpensive pastels, because in this case, what you're paying for is a low grade uh, pigment um, that is going to be uh, mixed with chalk to get color consistency. Uh, and then it's usually mixed with carnival wax to get well, a pastel uh, needs to have some sort of binder. Uh, and when you do that and you put it on sandpaper and you put it on your model, uh, things can go just everywhere um, and separate. And it's really, really terrible. Uh, same thing if you put um, varnish over the carnival wax, it often goes cloudy and just terrible and will make you sad. 
Uh, so avoid that. Look for pure art grade pigments. All right, and let's get to those. Uh, with the plane, were the layers silver, then hairspray, then black on top? Yes, um, the plane is, uh, I did the uh, silver out of the rattle can, um, and then it's layers of blue and purple and black all over the hairspray. And that's been sitting there for more than a week. Um, I don't even remember when I actually touched that last, probably a couple of weeks. Uh, things have been very busy. All right, so with our dry pigments, we have several, several options for applying them and for keeping them in place once they're applied. Today, for expediency's sake, I am using 99% isopropyl. Um, anything 91% or better will do. Uh, anything less just includes a higher water content and it's gonna take a lot longer to dry. Um, that said, you can use water. <laughs> I have seen a great army uh, of imperial fists where uh, it was all shaded using secret weapons, uh, one of the pigments, one of the browns, I forget which one, um, but mixed with water, brushed over everybody and then wiped off and it, they look great. Um, I really didn't think that would work, but it super did. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I said, for expediency, uh, expediency's sake today, um, I'm using isopropyl. Uh, the other products on the market are actual pigment fixatives. These are enamel, um, effectively brush on enamel varnish. Uh, the three big names out there are uh, AK, Ammo, and Secret Weapon for those. Uh, and the difference is in drying time. Um, the uh, AK one takes an awfully long time to dry. Um, MIGS is kind of in the middle um, and mine dries very quickly, 15 minutes tops usually. Uh, depending on humidity and conditions, all of that sort of thing, but it's meant to be a 15 minute dry time. Um, and the trick between those three brands uh, is the viscosity. Um, mine has a very low viscosity. It flows very quickly, uh, which is what helps it dry quickly. Um, obviously the one that takes, uh, you know, a long time to dry about an hour or so um, has a higher viscosity. So um, I certainly know some people where uh, uh, they use the, the, more, the thicker brand, even though it takes longer, uh, just because they don't like their brush control. And I get that. Um, the other thing to remember as I'm working with isopropyl is that there is literally no better way to strip a model than isopropyl. So no brushes. <laughs> you don't want to go brushing this around. Uh, can I give some examples of effects with green oxide and other non-earthy colors? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Let's do that now instead of this. I mean, I might be obsessed with the rest of it. It doesn't mean everybody has to be. So in this case, I'm stippling it on. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get it where I want it. I am painting my picture. And it's a dry powder, so I can still wick it away. It's a little too heavy. Boom, brush it off. Boom, brush it off. And now what I'm going to do is get my isopropyl and I'm gonna get it close to this, but I'm gonna let capillary action pull it off. So what I really wanna let happen is let it wick into that space. This is dirt, so it's thirsty. So that is the dry application method. In this case, what I'm doing now with the isopropyl, of course, is sealing it in place. Uh, it's the same point you would use the um, pigment fixative, the pigment fixer. Uh, with a pigment fixer or any other enamel products that you find that you're working with um, and the pigments, uh, if you get uh, any silvering around the edges, uh, in fact, if you find yourself with some glue silvering on any of your models, uh, you can actually come in with some dry pigment and just brush it over that glue silvering and it'll go away like magic. Now, while that's wet, I'm going to come in with a couple of heavy spots on my green here. Go poke, 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 poke. Clean that off. My other method, and you can tell I do this a lot because I have these cups handy, is to make a wash. Hey, look, there's a bright color. Uh, in that case, I'm using my 99% isopropyl. 
I'm mixing it with my dry pigment. See what else we've got here. Ooh. Rust. Ooh, I love that color. Let's use some of that. Uh, is there a key to choosing which rust color to use? That's a great question, and it depends if you're going for realism. Uh, yes, yes, there is. Um, the fresher the rust, the brighter the rust, uh, which is why if you look at um, like old trellis train bridges, they've got that beautiful purple to them. Um, my favorite color. Um, but yeah, uh, and then the lighter it is, you're going to get your uh, oranges and your yellows. Um, and if you've got areas that are starting to actually pull away, um, that's where you're going to find your reds more than anything else. Uh, in terms of fantasy land, oh, good golly gosh, no. Um, one of the last big projects I did for uh, Nova Open Charitable Foundation was uh, uh, Stompa with the Forge with Belly Gun. And on all of the red sections of armor, I certainly wasn't going to rust it and grime it in reds and things like that. So, you know, I came in with my blues and my greens like this because it was a nice pop and nice contrast. Uh, and I do the same thing when I do cans and things like that. I'll do them in red, but I always make sure that the um, grime and goo and buildup on them is blue. Um, one of the fun products uh, Anne helped me make is our engine fluid. So these are the paints that I really do use when I'm weathering. And I really do use this Boop. on engines. So that's not a wash or an ink, that's an acrylic paint. So I'll use it to get that uh, coolant look on an engine. Plus it's a handy little panel liner apparently. <laughs> All right, so now I have my uh, wash here of the pigment. And the nice thing about these little uh, Dixie cups is you can actually kind of control how much pigment you're gonna get um, so I can roll it this way and I can get more pigment because it's left behind. Um, come in and uh, come in and not do this on the hairspray side, Justin. Um, definitely don't do it on the hairspray side. It's going to gum up and get funky. So I can come in and apply my wash, get my areas. Let's get this corner down here. It's a little blue. Again, I'm being gentle because I don't want to uh, brush it because the isopropyl will strip the model too to sweet. Nothing is better for stripping models. Don't believe any of the things. The answer is always and will always be isopropyl. It is amazing. Well, you are wet, which was silly of me. You don't want to go sticking your wet brush into your dry pigments. And yes, it is 91% uh, or higher. Um, I'm using 99% uh, uh, and the wash is pigment and isopropyl. And thank you there. All right. Blend that out a bit so it's a little less heavy right there. I'm going to come back with some, let's get another green color to hang on out. Nope, must put it away. Yep. Let's get my lighter blue here. So this is faded blue. I'm going to add. A little more visual interest in here. A 
And since this side doesn't have all the hairspray, <laughs> it should work a lot better. But let's go check to see how it worked on the hairspray side. Who knows, maybe we got lucky. All right, so that is now locked in place. And sure enough, the hairspray side worked out. And I'll hit this side with the blow dryer real quick. I know you've all missed its soothing sound. There's that big blue. Uh, on the leave and rust, uh, I think I wound up using my light verdigris. Oh, this for the rust. Um, that was the orange rust done as a wash. And this was just uh, light verdigris and uh, black to get the paint chip. All right, now let's talk about one last way to use the dry pigments. And I love this one. We're going to use two very specific colors for this. Use black and white. Yeah, the pigments uh, really shouldn't be um, coming off if you've sealed them. And you can seal them uh, with a rattle can, but the challenge to sealing with a rattle can is if you've got the hull of your vehicle here and you've got pigment on top, when you hit it with a rattle can, you're putting essentially a candy coating over that pigment. And over time, particularly if you're handling that model, if you're gaming with it, like I do, uh, most of my weather models see the table or used to, um, that candy coating, that, that enamel spray uh, can come off, exposing the pigment and getting it to come off, fall off. Um, but I even have models that aren't sealed at all, where as long as I put the pigments in the right spot, I can still pick up my tanks. I just make sure that things like my Lehman Russ, um, you know, I, I very seldom um, actually heavily weather these sides uh, because that's generally how I pick up my tanks. Um, but that said, if you're using um, either my uh, enamel pigment fixative, um, the one from AK or the one from Ammo, um, what those do is because we're actually getting it in there and it's a brush on enamel, um, it soaks through the pigment, gets down to the hull, and creates a unified bond between the hull and the top. It sucks it up. And speaking of sucking it up, we should be able to give you a good example of that in just a second. This brush is dry. All right, we, we're going to set something on fire. <laughs> I'm gonna make a nice little pool right here. And we can do this to create mud. We can use it to create, well, you'll see in just a second. More of that awesome capillary action we talked about earlier. So I'm letting it Absorb through. In fact, the isopropyl, uh, because it's so good at eating acrylic paint, um, can actually get you a bond uh, between your pigment and your model a lot of time. So most of what I'm putting on right now, here, uh, right now is actually going to be fairly uh, stable. Um, but any varnishing I, I would do before I did uh, my pigments, that pigments would be the the last um, the last thing that I do. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's very kind. I play reaction. Has it been more than five minutes since I mentioned that isopropyl is the best thing for stripping models? All right. 
How sturdy is this? Well, let's start by hitting it with the blow dryer. Let's see how much we lose. It should be none. That's none. Now I'm not gonna wanna go rubbing my finger across that, but it's not coming off. A little bit here, a little, little big floofy pieces, but very little. So it's not a section I'm gonna wanna handle. And I tend to do effects like this uh, flat. It tends to be ground cover. Um, if I'm doing um, uh, burned out road wheels, uh, um, burned out buildings, uh, you can get the timbers around it and you've got, you know, ash on the ground. Um, same thing, you can take uh, ends of pieces of wood if you're trying to make them look uh, like they're burning, a fluorescent pink paint, uh, dabbled on a little bit on the inside with the black and white pigments along the edges, um, really makes it look like it's hot, like it's on fire! <laughs> All right. Um, questions about pigments, uh, questions about pigments, oils, enamels, chipping, anything we've covered so far. And yeah, Maria, if you're talking about the Lehman Rust panel piece, um, yeah, some of that might have been the uh, the oil paint. Uh, this original oil paint here uh, was raw sienna. And yeah, that's how I'm buying our uh, isopropyl these days. The one that's gotten harder is uh, nitrile gloves, not surprisingly, but uh, fortunately we still have a stash for work, so. But all right, so here are the pigments. We've done it as a wash, we've done it as dry and then sealing it in place. Um, done it as sprinkling and stippling, which again, we could use uh, dirt colors for to create a uh, dirt texture. Um, I promised you mud, didn't I? Let me go get, uh, da, 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 da. are you where you belong? You're not, right back. And I'm back. Sorry about that, folks. Mud's not normally one we have time to cover in class. So I actually had to go out to the garage and get a snow kit. I don't need the snow, but I do need the realistic water because that is my other ingredient here. Grab me a mixing cup. Oh, we've got a question. I see a question. Any major difference in using something like Vallejo chipping fluid versus salt or hairspray? worth the cost. Um, I have not found it to be worth the cost, uh, to be honest. Um, and I say that given that Secret Weapon has spent years trying to develop a chipping formula that I'm happy with. Um, I actually send my samples um, to several people um, uh, and get feedback, but, but none of us have been happier with, with any of those products than we are with our hairspray. Um, each of us has our favorite brand, um, but on the whole, most of us are AquaNet folks. Uh, it's just, some, I don't know, started in the 80s or 90s or something and stuck with us. Uh, it's what I used to use for my mohawk, so just sort of have it now, I guess. All right, let's see. Dark earth, dark earth, two dark earth. 
How about we use some dark earth since I have some? Too much. You don't need that much mud today, do you? Let's get a bit of that. We need a little bit of violet. We need a little bit of clay brown. That's another dark earth. What the heck? I wonder what I was working on when I stocked pigments last. Slate gray. Oh no, slate gray will not do. Green earth, maybe? Sand sands. There you are. Nope. This will do. All right. Shoop doop doop doop. Uh, I have my pigment. Um, care to show your engine wash on screen again? Yeah, sure. Lehman Ross panel. And this is from the. Um, wait, this is Blue Heat. Did I? I just picked up Blue Heat. Come back here. Your engine wash. Yep, there's engine fluid. Uh, it's part of a trio, actually, that is. Uh, I mean, I never mind showing off. Ann and I worked really hard to get these right, so we're pretty happy with them. This is old oil. I'll spread that out here in a minute. Now, one of the things we really wanted to do with these is make sure they were formulated for how they're supposed to color shift and all that when I'm actually using them uh, on projects. So we didn't just get the color. Uh, like these have the clear base. Um, and old oil has a teeny tiny bit of the ultra fine uh, metallic flake that Anne is using these days. But just that teeny tiny bit to give a, you know, a hint of the uh, metal wear. So there's fresh oil. And here is the engine fluid. Boop. And let's pull that oil spill out for you. And it a bit here at the edge. Get our little translucency right here. And the fresh oil, you can see, is just going to flow a lot more easily to get that fresh oil stain. Shazam! Uh, the engine wash that I used on that panel is engine fluid. So with my pigment, if I'm doing mud, I can also mix in some sand. Um, I tend to have bags of Oregon beach sand sitting around for that sort of thing, and I do. Uh, but today we're just gonna go straight pigment. I'm just gonna add a little bit of the realistic water product. And you guessed it, I'm gonna make a slurry. I'm gonna make mud. I will apply that. What have I got? What have I got? What have I got? I'll just do it on this. And cake, is it still dry? Nope.
I'll hit that with the blow dryer in a minute, see how far I can get us. Now the trick is it does take time, a long time to dry, the realistic water does. You can also use a uh, glass medium. If you've got a bottle of the glass medium uh, sitting around, that'll work as well. Uh, matte medium, if you're trying to go a bit drier, um, I will sometimes take uh, very fine bits of um, static grass, um, chop them up even finer so it's, you know, uh, that or even some of the um, fine uh, foliage from Woodland Scenics. Um, something fine, something thin, uh, grass-like that you can mix in here as well. You can mix in some sand with it as well. Um, but a base of um, any gloss or matte medium. Um, I'm using the realistic water because it's what I have. And yeah, I can sprinkle uh, pigment over the top to make it look more dry, more wet. Um, whatever I need to do, I can come in and tweak it um, for quite some time because that realistic water takes a long time. Hey, kiddo. I'm teaching my class right now, buddy. Can you uh, close the door for me? You can talk to your mom about that, buddy. You need to let me finish my class, please. Thanks, kiddo. Seamus, I need to finish my class, kiddo. Thank you. <laughs> Some people's kids, am I right? Ah, gotta love them. All right. Um, if making mud puddles under that, I have found golden gel mat works for clumpy puddles. Uh, yeah, you can certainly do that. Any of the heavier uh, mediums as well. Um, I tend to use the Woodland Scenics products, so I've got uh, the, um, uh, there's realistic water and water effects, uh, which is their thick, goopy stuff, and I use a lot of that as well. Um, flowing metal effects like mercury. Wow, that's cool. Um, wow. Uh, not off the top of my head. Um, that seems like it's going to be more uh, a paint effect than anything else. It's certainly to get the um, flow ring across a model. Uh, I've done that for some of our swamp bases uh, by letting PVA thicken up and letting it run a runnel down for me uh, with some gravity. So you could get that flowing liquid that way. Uh, but then I'm casting those in, in resin. I wouldn't recommend PVA, uh, regular white glue on a model uh, long term. Um, even the gel mediums have a, a tendency to come up like that. Um, so I'd really say you're going to want to go for a, a paint effect or something like that. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I will certainly also use the uh, heavier mediums um, and the realistic water with our crushed glass uh, to make snow because it's actually sparkly, shiny, translucent, clear glass. And it makes a very realistic snow. Um, for heavier snow berms, uh, where they tend to be a lot more opaque instead of slushy, uh, in that case, um, anything except bicarbonate. I really like, uh, again, big fan of Woodland Scenics products, so I like their soft flake snow for things like that. It's a good quality product, um, especially since they reformulated it, made it even better um, because it's nice and fine. Um, and those polyvinyl products aren't going to yellow on you or anything like that. Do heat effects on metal fall under weathering? They certainly do. And I can talk about that real quick. We've certainly got the time. We've got our half hour here. Uh, in fact, that's why I have the ruler. Uh, and I was practicing the heat effects on this. Um, you can brush this. You can airbrush this. Uh, da, 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 da. I will brush it because uh, I'm here. Um, and I'm sure everyone is shocked that I have a heat set. <laughs> So this is our heat trio, which includes uh, blue heat, orange heat, and purple heat. But you can do this with similar colors, make them washes. Yeah, weathering is simply the interplay between the subject and its environment. Um, there was a year I was judging at ReaperCon and somebody had the Pegaso models Zulu Warrior, which is uh, one of my favorite pieces. Um, I've always wanted to paint it, but I'm, I'm so uh, intimidated by skin tones in general um, that doing a you know largely naked anything is just like, ah, I'm, I'm gonna screw this up. Uh, it's not what I do. I, I do vehicles and giant monsters and buildings and cars and trucks and planes and spaceships. But after looking at this thing for days and absolutely being in love with it, I, something was just bugging me. And I, I couldn't really figure out why until I realized that it was sitting on one of the most beautiful desert bases I had ever seen. It was one of the most beautiful skin tone jobs I've ever seen. 
and its feet were totally clean. The model's feet, 100% clean, not, not a speck of dirt on them. So somebody did all this great job painting the model perfectly, making the base perfectly, uh, but they never married the subject to its environment. Um, it wouldn't have uh, clean feet. He, he wouldn't. It just, just walking through the desert, uh, there'd be dust on um, knees, there'd be dust on ankles, feet. Um, and yeah, that's where we came up with the idea that when you start handing out the little lanyard flags that are dirty boots, and anybody who has a weathered feet gets a special little tag from me. And here's our mud coming along, drying up fairly quick now. All right, but let's talk about that heat. Um, just going to do this on the edge of the panel here uh, because I don't actually have a gun and some metal to work with for you, but this will certainly give the uh, idea. I am going to wet blend these together so that they actually flow nicely. You can also do it with glazes. Uh, those of you taking a glazing class, um, I'll show that too, I suppose. Now I'll come in here. Can also get a really nice smooth effect by washing, or sorry, not by washing, um, by airbrushing. This one was an airbrush test, obviously. And the blue's mostly worn off because that was over here. It tends to be where I'm holding. My little divots. And of course, we can. So that would be the metal showing through, getting me a little brighter, a little darker. I'll wind up doing that on the plane I have over here, but I haven't actually gotten to the point where I'm painting the engines yet. All right, and of course, if we do this as washies, we make a nice thin. Orange doesn't want to take right now. There it goes. We can get our very teeny tiny heat effect. It's a little. All right, what else can we cover? It's really nice having all of this uh, extra time in a class. Nobody rushing through the door trying to set up for their next class too. It's great. Oh, well, as far as the class time goes, you had two hours, so. Yep. Yep. There's yep. plenty of time to kind of do whatever anyone asks or whatever you want to show. Exactly. It's uh, At this point, it's all your time, folks. If there's anything in particular folks want to uh, cover, I'll cover that. Uh, otherwise, um, I'll probably start playing with that uh, plane here again, since I am talking about a lot of these techniques here. Uh, we can actually look at how I approach. A competition piece uh, that's going to have the hairspray technique on it. Yeah, in this case, the emphasis, uh, it's going to be, um, I still need to build the skids for it. I've confirmed that uh, Imperial Navy planes have skids for some reason, so I need to build a set of skids for them. They, uh, for whatever reason, didn't bother to, um, you know, give it landing gear. I guess they figure it's supposed to be flying and shooting and doing all those things in a game, but uh, pff, where's the fun of that? Uh, with the hairspray method, should you cover the entire thing, or have you ever hairsprayed uh, in a container and then brushes flicked it on? 
Uh, yes, I have actually put um, hairspray into a container. Um, it's one of the things I love about my little Dixie cups. Um, you cover it up with your hand, spray into here. Uh, you can also do that with enamel rattle cans, uh, wear a glove, <laughs> so you're not getting uh, enamel uh, spray paint all over your hand. Um, but yeah, that works too. Uh, we've got a big Totoro statue uh, that we just finished in our front yard, and that's how I got the um, circles around the eyes as I sprayed uh, black enamel paint into one of these cups and then used a brush to outline the eyes. In the case of this piece, um, it is going to be landed. I have the uh, um, adding additional cockpit detailing here, so it'll be open. Because uh, I tend to yeah detail things, so added um, all of the control mechanisms here, um, here, uh, the seat belts, the uh, ejection rings, some power cabling, um, the lift system that's actually going to be holding up the thing, a bunch of cabling and tubes. Uh, and the actual uh, flight stick, since it didn't come with a flight stick. Or it might have with a pilot or something, but I don't have a pilot. This was a second-hand gift. A uh, friend had it, uh, decided they weren't going to do anything with it, and would I like it? And oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> I'm going to have to go with yes. Yes, I would. You actually did get two comments as well for questions. Oh. There we go. Uh, on the chat side, uh, burn bullet damage for Base vehicles. Um, yeah, we can talk about that real quick. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, what have I got? What have I got? In fact, I have my Payne's Gray right here, and I have a very abused Lehman Rust panel right here. Ooh, maybe. There we go. I wasn't sure the Payne's Gray was going to open. And this is one uh, where just like the uh, rust effects with oils, um, you can do this with a thin black um, acrylic wash, uh, but you're going to have a lot less time to work. So you're going to have to, I really recommend spending some time practicing that. Um, it definitely takes some effort to get to a point where you can uh, consistently apply um, rust effects and streaking effects like this uh, with the acrylics. But it's just a matter of practice like anything else. All right, so we're going to get uh, blasted right here. And I'm doing it just like I would do the rust effects. So I'm gonna do this, except now I'm gonna get that extra blasty mark, right? Got our little offshoots, our little spider legs. That's my brush. And if you have Payne's Gray, I do recommend that in place of a black, because um, it's going to give you that blue-black, which is more of a carbon score. Get out of there. Go away. So there we go. Uh, yeah, for things like the bullet chipping and things like that, that's certainly where I use the tape method for. Um, uh, also, um, things like claw marks can be done that way. Uh, if you've got a cage or something you're trying to show that it was clawed at, um, that certainly works. Absolutely. But then for metal scratches, I mean, I am doing metal scratches on this bad boy. But this is being done with the uh, hairspray method to show the wear on the panels from pilot ingress and egress. And you're all get it back on camera, Justin. And it's still here too. I mean, that's one of the fun things. Like I said, I haven't touched this model in weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. I don't remember when it last was, but.
hairspray still works. Work in small sections, always small sections at a time. And in this case, I want to be gentle. So I'm coming in actually with a pair of tweezers. Was the toothpick method you were looking at earlier the same as the airbrush needle? Yes, it is, Bill. Um, exactly the same. Um, I would normally use toothpicks um, since my little toothpick container is missing. I just use an airbrush needle. Uh, just about anything will work. Um, I've got steel wool sitting around. Um, like I said, I'll do it with the uh, sponges too. Um, like I'm going to get the sponge in here right now to try and get some streak on that white right here along the edge. Now it's subtle, but the washes will bring it out later. You can see the metal coming through. Well, maybe you can't. No, you're not gonna be able to see it there. But I can get it off, uh, say here, after all this time. with Q-tip, cut and swab, get some of the excess out of here. And expose some of the metal on our little raised bit there. All right, uh, would a plastic yard sign at Walmart work to practice uh, weathering effects on? Heck yeah. Uh, any of those little like corrugated plastic um, signs, anything like that. Uh, one of the things that I actually do on a regular basis is take a, a bottle of uh, Elmer's glue and wrap it in uh, aluminum foil, um, tape it along one edge and uh, prime it. So now I've got a you know, curved surface to work with. I can actually uh, add some folds and creases if I want to practice um, things like cloth. Uh, but I just spend a lot of time painting um, aluminum foil just wrapped around something. Uh, you just want to make sure you're giving yourself the right size surface to work on for what you're trying to practice. Um, another totally random piece of advice for folks that are uh, starting out with airbrushing, if you're going to be learning to airbrush in the near future, uh, rather than work on models, I recommend picking up a large format coloring book. Um, anybody's going to have uh, something like that on sale somewhere. Uh, so for a couple of bucks, you know, you get a, you know, 12 by 24 um, Star Wars or whatever coloring book. I've got a big Hello Kitty one and uh, out in the garage that I'll still practice on. Uh, and practice uh, painting inside the lines, transitioning. Um, yeah, you can get a lot of good practice uh, that way. Um, plus learning to paint on paper is gonna give you, a, a, I think, a quicker uh, understanding of uh, how, um, uh, how to control your flow and all of that. Uh, and it's true, uh, Pinterest for free coloring books, uh, but the uh, material is different. Uh, I don't recommend painting on printer paper. Um, so if you have um, art paper or uh, new stock, uh, great. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, you'll want that uh, fleshier material. Oh, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, teaching is very much a pleasure for me. I've missed it a lot. I know that uh, everyone had uh, other things they could be doing today, and I really appreciate you being here with me. Uh, this has really been fantastic. Uh, I do not know that I have a badge code for my class. Uh, if I do, it's news to me. <laughs> I, yeah, as I say, I don't believe you do, because John would have informed.
Okay, yeah, I don't think so then. Well, do you want to stay for any more questions or anything else or shall we close down the poll? Uh, yeah, if people want to stick around for a few minutes, that's great. It sounds like folks are starting to head out though. So in that case, I guess we'll wrap up and uh, yeah, say hi to everybody again. Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, weathering wood. Okay, weathering wood. We can, we can roll out of here with some weathering wood. Go for it. Um, step one, to the surprise of probably nobody at this point, because if you've been paying any attention, it should not shock you to learn that I have a wood trio. <laughs> Uh, and the reality is, um, I really do use these three colors to create um, any version of weathered wood uh, that I'm doing. Um, whether we're starting as a dark wood or we're starting with a light wood, um, I always weather them from here. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Do I, have a, I have an example. I have a handy dandy example. So the deck you're about to see in the back of this pickup truck is plastic. Uh, sometimes I'll go back and I'll actually use um, wood strip to replace it. Um, that way I can actually stain the wood. Like these pieces on the side here uh, are actually wood. And I put the bits of Coca-Cola sign on the top of them just to add that little extra, little extra zazz. And the sign broke on its last trip. Um, but yeah, in this case, that deck in the back uh, is entirely plastic. There's no um, no redetailing there, um, and that was done with this set. Um, the trick is, I tend to only use two of the colors at a time. Again, if I'm going for a light wood or dark wood. So I'll start with uh, look at the dark wood over here for us. Boom, your wood. Hmm. And I'm gonna brush where I want grain. Pink towel. And this is the weathered wood versus the dark wood. I'm gonna come in here. I'm actually gonna stipple some of this around. Okay, and then more stippling. Such stipple, much wow. Happy trees. Now this was wet blended. Uh, let me hit it with the blow dryer so you can see it. You don't get the shine. And that's obviously very quick. Um, I'd come in this point um, with a black wash. Um, in fact, we've got time. Let's do it. Let's do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Are you black? You're black. I'm grabbing a black ink because I saw it and it's convenient. And 
this out. really thick. Get my finger involved now. And that's fine. I also hear, uh, for a long time, I've been hearing people say that you shouldn't touch your models where you're working on them. And uh, I hope you guys can help me uh, put that myth to rest. Um, I use my fingers to correct problems on my models all the time. Probably off screen. Nope. All right. Get our little water line here at the bottom. Define a few more panels. Now, a fun trick. Let's see if I have a stiff enough brush. I should have a good brush just like I would for spatters and other effects. I'm gonna spatter my wood, mm, maybe a little too much today, that's okay. And then I'm gonna come in and try to wick away portions of that to get me that kind of knot effect. Clean up my bottom a bit. And again, I'm working really quick and really dirty. Pull that one down, make it a little longer. And then I'm gonna get nice and wet in the middle. See how I've sucked away the middle of it? Give me that little outline. I'm just gonna blend these in. Just a little bit, all those little speckles. Dark weathered wood. For the faded handle wood, uh, I would use uh, very much the same um, process and technique. Um, except I would just start with a different base coat, um, which gets me that nice warm uh, wood color. But I find that with these three colors, um, I can create just about any tree that I need to. Um, if I'm doing something like birch uh, wood or another light wood, um, yeah, I just start with the white. Oh, I have some over here. Good. Don't have to go so heavy. Let's take some of that off then. Boop. Boop. Quick and dirty. And then again, once this is all dry, I can come in and give a nice light wash to bring the panel lines back out, the individual uh, wood panels. All right. Man, this is great. We got to cover all sorts of extra stuff today. I love every minute of it. Thank you all again for being here with me. Um, it is just about the end of our time here, so I'm wrapping up. Uh, any last minute questions for us folks because I'm here and I'm happy to help. Uh, otherwise, as always, happy hobbying from everyone at Reaper and Secret Weapon. Uh, yeah, be around. Um, doing this again tomorrow if anybody wants to uh, refresh or otherwise enjoy the rest of your classes, enjoy the rest of your time and happy hobbying. And thank you as well. Uh, if you don't mind handing the host back and I will close down the poll and other such things. You betcha.
that should do it. Awesome. And Arco Swan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See you guys later. Have a great evening. You too. Cheers.